Today at six, a frantic last day of campaigning in England, Wales and Scotland. Up to 40 million people can vote tomorrow. The Covid election, from councillors and mayors across England to parliamentary votes in Scotland and Wales. There's a lot at stake. There are contests big and small in the first real test of public opinion since that dramatic election. There are so much at stake in different corners of the country. If the SNP win an outright majority here in Scotland, will that take us one step closer to another independence referendum? After 22 years in power in Wales, will Labour win enough seats in the Senate to keep them in government? And there'll be a by-election in Hartlepool, a big test for Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer. Also tonight. Just hours after this meeting with Priti Patel, India's foreign minister self-isolates because two members of his team test positive for Covid. In some parts of Wales, the over-18s are being offered a Covid jab. We'll have the latest developments in the UK vaccination programme. Back in the pool again, but two million school kids lost out on swimming lessons because of the pandemic. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, Manchester City have already made it. Tonight, can Chelsea get past Real Madrid and reach the Champions League final? Good evening and welcome to the BBC's News at Six. Up to 40 million people in Great Britain go to the polls tomorrow. From votes to the Scottish Parliament, which could affect the future of the United Kingdom, to local elections in England, which might influence planning regulations. There's rarely been a polling day outside general elections when so much is up for grabs. So, there are votes for both the Scottish and Welsh parliaments. In England, there are elections for mayors in 13 of the biggest city areas, some council elections and the London Assembly. There are also 39 police and crime commissioners up for election in England and Wales. Finally, there's a by-election in Hartlepool, which could tell us how Labour is doing in what was once its heartland. The only place in the UK without any elections tomorrow is Northern Ireland. Let's join our political editor, Laura Koonsberg. Laura. George, as you suggested, it's almost like an encyclopedia of elections. There are small contests from the tiniest of parish councils, big contests that raise constitutional questions, particularly in Scotland, but also in Wales. And for the main party leaders, there are big pressures. Can the Tories show that they are keeping up the momentum when they flipped so many seats from blue to blue, red to blue in the general election? Can Keir Starmer, in his first test at the polls as Labour, leader show that he's helping to undo the damage of years past. There's so much at stake, a chance for the public, after a strange year indeed, to have a say. Watch the stunts. Morning. You might think it's a general election. It's not quite yet, but tomorrow there is a huge sweep of ballots. One more. One more. Okay. Come on, we can do it. And everyone in Great Britain has the first chance to have a say since his victory in 2019. It's kind of birdie dance type thing. Oh dear. Go, it's then. a very important set of elections and the choice, I think, is, is clear uh, between uh, you know, the, the Labour opposition, who seem absolutely determined to continue to play uh, political games, and government that is getting on with our agenda, uh, getting on with the people's priorities. Jam. Rice pudding. Tomatoes. But it's the first time, too, that Keir Starmer faces the electorate as the Labour leader. I've got five plus one, is that...? 18 months since his party took a thumping. Pressure on him to show it can get back on voters' lists. Fantastic, ready to roll. We're going into the uh, elections tomorrow, fighting to, uh, for every vote. We've got excellent candidates, and what we need across the country are Labour candidates from their communities, of their communities, that are going to stand up against this government. And that's the choice before the country tomorrow. Decisions have been on hold in some parts of the country. One of so many delays during the coronavirus emergency that emptied our streets. So now there's a whopping 4,000 council seats up for grabs. 
a vital election for an MP in Hartlepool, city mayors and elections in Scotland and Wales too. But normal glad handing and door knocking has been restricted this time. Less face to face than mask to mask. We have had a weird election campaign uh, because of the pandemic and we've not been able to get on the doors as much as we would have liked to. But when we have managed to talk to people, they're responding positively to the Liberal Democrat message because we are community politicians. People know that if they get a Liberal Democrat councillor, things get done. The cost of temporary accommodation in Lambeth is it's into the millions. And with multiple contests in different corners of the country, there are multiple parties fighting. This growing you know, recognition of the importance of the climate and ecological emergency, recognising that you know, we are going to face a very uncertain and dangerous future if we don't do something right now. And that change needs to happen now and it means that if, you, know, you need to vote green to get green. This is a strange set of elections, not just because of the pandemic, but because of the scale. Millions upon millions of votes will be cast tomorrow and they'll all matter. Even the tiniest parish council has an impact on how we live our lives. But there are contests from the smallest to the most significant of levels. National elections in Wales, and particularly in Scotland, that could trigger arguments about the future of the Union, the future of the United Kingdom itself. And the moment when the power, the decisions, transfer to you is nearly here. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News. Now, in Scotland, there are 129 seats up for grabs at Holyrood, with the SNP aiming for an overall majority. If that happens, it could reignite the argument with Downing Street over another independence referendum. Here's our Scotland editor, Sarah Smith, on the final day of campaigning. In this unusual, socially distanced election, it's not the pandemic that dominates the debate, but instead it's the question of Scottish independence. That's tricky for Scottish Labour, who know they need to rebuild a lot of support before they can really challenge the SNP. If you want to help build a credible alternative to Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP, you need to support me in this election campaign. Help me do it. But you don't expect to win this election campaign. You don't expect to be First Minister yourself next week. Well, I, I, I am many things. I, I doubt I'm Superman. So given where we were um, 10 weeks ago in the polls, uh, and given where we need to get to, uh, I don't think it was possible, but that's up to the people of Scotland to decide. Stirling Castle gives a historic backdrop to what's being described as the most important Scottish election since the devolved parliament was set up. And that's because if the SNP win an overall majority, they will claim that's an electoral mandate for having another referendum on Scottish independence. The Tories want to do what it says on the posters. They claim they're the only party that can stop an independence referendum. What we can't have is an SNP majority government to go ahead unchecked. We need a check in Holyrood to stop them forging ahead with their plans to divide our country all over again. So even if you don't win, you think you can block them from having another vote? Vote Scottish Conservatives to stop that SNP majority, to stop a second independence referendum, and crucially, to allow us to focus on our recovery, to focus on all these issues that haven't got the attention during this election campaign, because we've all been speaking about independence, because the SNP have put that front and centre of their plans, and let's get the debate in Scotland back on the issues that people really want. The Scottish Lib Dem leader will do almost anything to get his party noticed, and he's equally determined to try and stop another independence referendum. Vote for Liberal Democrats in every corner of Scotland, because that will make sure the next parliament is focused on recovery, not on independence. The Scottish Greens are obviously focused on the climate emergency, but believe that could be better tackled in an independent Scotland. We would like to have a referendum to go back and ask the people of Scotland that democratic question, who would you like making your decisions? Brexit's here, Tories in Westminster, or a government in Scotland that we've actually voted for. The SNP have taken their campaign right across Scotland. But even if Nicola Sturgeon can persuade voters here to back her plan for a referendum, she'll still face another hurdle as the Prime Minister can veto a vote on independence. Look, the Prime Minister is not immune or exempt from democracy. I know he thinks he is, but he's not. But, you know, let me just be very clear, uh, as I have been throughout this campaign, I'm not proposing a referendum now. If I'm re-elected as First Minister tomorrow, my priority, my focus, my 100% dedication is on continuing to lead Scotland through the Covid crisis. The Holyrood Parliament could soon become the centre of an unprecedented constitutional battle. If the SNP do achieve a majority, they will demand a vote on Scotland leaving the UK. A referendum that Westminster insists it has the right to refuse. Two parliaments at odds over the future of the Union. Sarah Smith, BBC News. 
Dumbarton. Voters will be electing 60 politicians to sit in the Welsh Parliament, known as the Senate. Welsh Labour have held power for more than two decades, but face significant challenges from the Welsh Conservatives and Plaid Cymru. Our Wales correspondent, Howell Griffith, joins us now. Hello. George, yes, Labour may have been in charge here in Wales for 22 years, but their campaign has focused mostly on the last 14 months. Mark Drakeford's role in leading Wales through the pandemic. Quiet and cautious, maybe, but the recognition has given him has made him a bit of a political rock star in Welsh circles. Certainly he, rather than Keir Starmer, has led the charge in Wales. The Welsh Conservatives will want people to think back to pre-pandemic times, in that 2019 general election when several red wall seats turned blue in North Wales. It's in south and west Wales that Labour come under threat from Plaid Cymru. They see the pandemic as potentially precursor to independence, given how many decisions have been made here in Wales about people's fate. For the Lib Dems, tomorrow is a question of survival. They only had one member in the last Senate. Can they hold on to their one seat? It's fair to say this stage hasn't really delivered much drama over the years. Only 12 of the 40 constituency seats have actually changed hands since 1990. But many of them now are marginal, and so turnout could be key. It's never reached 50% in Wales. Will the pandemic make a difference? Will the weather keep people away? We'll find out on Friday. That's when counting in Wales begins. How oh, many thanks. So, what does the political map look like in Scotland and Wales? And what's up for election in England? Rita Chakrabarty has this report from our election studio. There's a bumper crop of elections this year. A full seven contests are underway, and this is because there were elections that have been delayed from last year that are taking place now. Crucial amongst these are elections to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, this is the map as it was after the last elections to the Parliament. As you can see, whole swathes of yellow there. Those are the SNP seats. They got 63 last time. They're aiming for 65 or more for a majority, which would then allow them, should they be able to, to aim for a second independence referendum. Let's take a look at some of the seats that we'll be looking at that are fought over in the Scottish Parliament. Here's a selection, and you can see from the colours at the end that they're held at the moment by Labour, Tory, Lib Dem and SNP, so all the main parties in play here. As well as the constituencies in Scotland, voters also vote for a second regional list. It's a form of proportional representation whereby they return members of the Scottish Parliament for a wider region. There's a similar system that is in place in Wales. Let's take a look at Wales where voters are voting for members of the Welsh Parliament, the Senate. There are 60 seats up for grabs here. You can see how the map looked after the last election. Down the spine of the country is the green, that's Plaid Cymru. Uh, Labour is strong in the south and also up there in the northeast and the Conservatives are strong in the west of the country and also by the English borders. Let's have a look similarly at some of the constituencies that we'll be watching very carefully. Llanetli, Delyn, very finely balanced margins there, so they should be very exciting contests. I want to also show you the local elections which are taking place in England and there are 5,000 seats uh, that are up for grabs here. Um, you can see here the the district councils as they were last time round and 5,000 seats that's about twice as many as you would have normally and again that is because of the delay due to Covid. Uh, let's go back to the list and remind ourselves that there are also elections to the London Assembly, there are mayoral elections, police and crime commissioners and also a by-election for Westminster in Hartlepool. We should be getting results uh, from Friday onwards but they will be slower than usual because counting is slower because of Covid so those results will come in from Friday and over the weekend. Rita Chakrabarty there. And you can uh, find out what elections are taking place in your area by entering your postcode into our search tool. That's on our website or the BBC News app. <clears throat>
The entire Indian delegation to the G7 summit of leading economies in London is self-isolating after two members tested positive for COVID-19. The news came as foreign ministers reconvened for the last day of the talks, which had been hailed as a return to face-to-face -face diplomacy. Our diplomatic correspondent James Landale reports. Boris Johnson dropping by the G7 talks this afternoon, determined to show confidence in an international meeting hit by a Covid scare, determined to show that face-to-face -face diplomacy is possible in a pandemic. India's foreign minister, a guest at the talks, has spent the last few days in London meeting counterparts from the United States and South Africa, even the Home Secretary, Priti Patel. But then this morning, this. In a tweet, he said that he was made aware yesterday evening of his exposure to possible COVID-positive cases. As a measure of abundant caution, I decided to conduct my engagements in the virtual mode. <laughs> India has suffered grievously in recent weeks, and it appears two junior officials may have travelled while infected. The Foreign Office has imposed tight Covid rules at Lancaster House and the Indian delegation had yet to attend any meetings here. But the cases were picked up by mandatory daily tests. Despite this, officials said Public Health England had ruled the talks could continue to the Prime Minister's relief. I think it's very important to try to, to continue as much business as you, as you can as a government. Uh, we have a very important relationship with India, with our, our G7 partners. Uh, as I understand it, what's happened is that the, the individuals concerned are all, uh, they're all isolating uh, now. So today, the Indian minister joined the meeting in the now traditional way. Officials say the discovery of these two cases show the effectiveness of the tight regulations they put in place. But it will surely raise questions about whether it's too early for face-to-face -face diplomacy like this and whether future planned international meetings should go ahead in person as planned. And so today's meeting continued. Top of the agenda? Yes, the Covid pandemic. James Landell, BBC News. The latest figures published by the Office for National Statistics show that the UK has recorded its lowest weekly number of deaths involving coronavirus since last September. But ministers say they're already looking ahead to the autumn when the NHS will be ready to give booster jabs to those over 50. And in some parts of Wales, as our health editor Hugh Pym reports, people over 18 are already being offered a jab. Waiting for vaccinations in North Wales today. And in some areas like this, those as young as 18 are being invited to have a first dose. People under 30 who work in health and social care and those who have health conditions have already been offered a jab. Now Welsh health boards have been given flexibility to offer it to the rest. I got a letter one day and just went here. Yeah, because I've got my letter. My twin sister hasn't had hers. She's got a letter through the... Um through the post and then uh, got a tax message and then just came here. Very quick, very, very good to be fair. Really surprised but really happy. Finally got it done and start getting back to normal. Latest figures on vaccinations for those aged 18 and over show in Wales 74% have had a first jab. In England it's 66% of adults, in Northern Ireland 65% and in Scotland 64% of adults. As the drive to offer all adults a first dose continues, ministers are already planning an autumn booster campaign. A range of options are being looked at, including tweaking jabs to protect against variants and mixing vaccines with a third dose different from the first two. The NHS team uh, is already planning to be ready for deployment from September onwards, but the decision hasn't been made as to whether we go September or later in the year or early next year. That depends on the clinicians. Testing existing and new vaccines against variants will be stepped up at Porton Down, run by Public Health England. Nearly £30 million will be invested by the government to increase capacity to analyse blood samples. These will show levels of antibodies generated by vaccines. Officials say for now they're watching closely the spread in the UK of Indian variants of the virus. At the moment we have not declared those variants of concern and that is because we don't have any evidence uh, so far that they are uh, either more severe in terms of clinical presentation 
or for example, that they have an adverse impact on the vaccine. But our, our investigations are ongoing and they are not completed yet. Aid flights to India are continuing. British Airways is flying 27 tonnes of medical items, including oxygen cylinders, to Delhi. A reminder that however positive the news here, the virus is taking a deadly toll in some other countries. Hugh Pym, BBC News. And the latest government figures show there were 2,144 new infections in the latest 24-hour period. So that's an average of 2,020 new cases per day in the last week. 27 deaths were reported in the latest 24-hour period. That's people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. On average, in the past week, 13 deaths were announced every day. The total number of deaths is now 127,570. As for vaccinations, a total of nearly 35 million people have now had their first dose of a COVID vaccine. And nearly 16 million people have had both doses and are now fully vaccinated. And the uh, time is 20 minutes past six, our top story this evening. Up to 40 million people head to the polls tomorrow, from councillors and mayors across England to parliamentary votes in Scotland and Wales. And still to come, from dancing to working as a doctor, busting the myths about living with deafness. Coming up in Sports Day on the BBC News Channel, Dan Evans' brilliant clay court season continues. The British number one beat Australian John Millman to reach the third round of the Madrid Open. Parents across England are being asked to prioritise swimming lessons for children who've been unable to take to the pool because of the pandemic. Swim England, the sport's governing body, says more than two million youngsters missed out. Joe Wilson reports. A busy afternoon in Birmingham. After school, swimming lessons are back on. So, children learning, parents watching. A long time you couldn't do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially Derek. He, he loves uh, swimming more than anything. It's about the mental health benefits of being with their peers and doing something that they love and getting out and doing some exercise. Over the past year of lockdown restrictions, some two million children have missed out on swimming completely, the governing body Swim England estimate. There's concern that this summer there might be 250,000 children in England who should have learned to swim but won't have managed to. Now, with summer holidays in particular often taking place near to water, the fear will move towards drowning. The drowning statistics will be out around May time for last year. We are expecting to see an increase in those, which to me is absolutely heartbreaking. And a lost generation will just add to that as the years go on. So we can't afford a lost generation of children not being able to swim. Now, the big moment has arrived for Leon Taylor. There are many ways to reach a pool. Here's how Leon Taylor did it. The Olympic diver has recently become a proud father and 10-month-old Ziggy has given Leon a fresh perspective. Swimming was actually my first love before I eventually found diving at the age of eight. So I'm chomping at the bit to get Ziggy in an environment where he can splash. He loves it in the bath. It's too cold for him in the sea. I go in the sea every day. Too cold for him in the sea, of course. But, you know, places like this, our local pool here, so important. And I can't wait to uh, uh, share that experience with him. Swim England believe 90% of pools are now operating again, most of them offering lessons. There's so much to catch up on after lockdown. Their reminder is to learn, to enjoy and to respect water. Joe Wilson, BBC News, Birmingham. There's been a funeral in the Pakistani city of Lahore for a young woman from London who was murdered in the city on Monday. Mayra Zulfika, who was 24, was shot at a, at a home she was renting. Police are investigating allegations that she was killed by two local men after turning down their marriage proposals. Donald Trump's suspension from Facebook has been upheld by the company's oversight board, but it also said the ban must be reviewed in six months' time. The former US president was suspended after posts he made when his supporters attacked the US Congress. Mr Trump attacked the board's decision and bans from the main tech platform, saying it was a total disgrace and an embarrassment to our country.
Kent Police have made a fresh appeal to the public for help in catching the killer of Police Community Support Officer Julia James. She was found dead in Ackholt Wood near Snowdown, eight days after taking her dog for a walk. Detectives have released a new picture of her in the same clothes she was wearing on the day she was murdered. Helena Wilkinson reports. This new image, released by Kent Police, shows Julia James walking her dog just as she had been on the day she was killed. She's also wearing the same clothing, apart from the gloves. Police hope it'll trigger people's memories. Police have yet to establish a motive for the attack. I do not know um, if it's somebody she knew. I do not know if it's a stranger attack. Of course, that possibility is particularly frightening. Uh, to local residents. I don't know, um, therefore, if it's someone who's regularly in the area. Not far from where Julia James was killed, officers are continuing to speak to residents as part of the investigation. So far, they've received over 700 pieces of information from the public, but they need more help. Today, they also released this map of the crime scene. They want to speak to anyone who was in the area between 1 and 4.30 last Tuesday afternoon. The police community support officer had been with the Kent Four since 2008, described as completely dedicated to serving the people of Kent. Some of the force's most experienced detectives are working on the murder investigation. It's clear from today's renewed appeal that they really need the public's help. Helena Wilkinson, BBC News, Aylsham in Kent. It's Deaf Awareness Week, the annual event that sees every UK charity and professional body working in the field coming together to promote awareness of the needs of the one in six people living in the UK who are affected by hearing loss. Here's Julian Pedelkalu from See Hear, the BBC programme for the deaf and hard of hearing. Hi, I'm Julian, and I'm the presenter on BBC See Here, a programme aimed at the deaf community to enjoy. See Here has been broadcast on the BBC for many years, and this year marks our 40th anniversary. But it's likely that many of you watching probably didn't even know about See Here. This week's Deaf Awareness Week, and it's an opportunity to learn more about the deaf community, including See Here. As part of Deaf Awareness Week, I want to dispel the myths around what deaf people can't do and show you otherwise. False. Whilst not all deaf people can hear music, we have our own unique ways of enjoying music. What would you say to those who believe the myth that deaf people can't engage with music? Well, music encompasses so much, and sound is only one small part of that. The rest of it is language. For example, reading, writing and playing music, the visuals and cultural. Music gives us so much and sound is just one part of that, which means that deaf people can of course take part in music. False. There's a wide range of deaf medical professionals and I'm going to meet one of them to tell us more. As a deaf doctor, what do you think of the advantage you have over your hearing colleagues? Can you give us an example? Because I'm deaf, I know how to adopt alternative methods of communication. This means for patients who use English as an additional language, I know how to adapt and work with their level of language. I also adjust my body language and use gestures. I've had comments from patients saying they really connect with me as communication is easier. So that's a good example of what my hearing colleagues can take on board. And this? Of course, it's a myth. We've got great deaf dancers out there, and I'm going to meet one to teach me some moves. Maybe. What would you say to those who believe the myth that deaf people can't dance? It's not just about using the ear to hear. Music is about feelings. When I play music, the vibration travels across the floor to my feet, travels up to my legs, to my heart, and then my mind. That's how the connection happens. It's how I understand the rhythm, patterns, frequencies, and high or low notes. So can you teach me some moves? Sure, come on. And six, seven, eight, one, two, three.
why don't you learn a bit of sign language so that you can meet deaf people and learn more about the fascinating deaf community. Happy Deaf Awareness Week. Julian Peter Kalu for BBC News. And that brings us to the weather with Thomas Schaffernacker. Hello, Thomas. Hi there, George, and a very good evening to you. The weather today was more typical of a day in March or April. Uh, lots of showers, thunderstorms, hailstorms as well. Some of them will continue into the evening hours and actually overnight. We're expecting some wintry weather in Scotland, particularly over the hills. And you can see a current of cold air coming straight out of the Arctic. It's been with us for quite some time. You add to that the strong May sunshine and you have the ingredients to form those big cumulonimbus clouds with those vigorous currents of air inside forming the hails. Hail st st stones, that is. Uh, so this is what we've got through the course of um, this evening. Uh, once the sun sets, the showers tend to sort of ease, uh, lose some of their oomph. But the snow showers will continue across Scotland through the night. Uh, with temperatures falling below freezing, there could be a little bit of iciness first thing in the morning on Thursday. And here's tomorrow's weather. So we still have that cold northerly airstream. You can see a bit of wintriness. But I think the showers tomorrow, again, hail and thunder possible, be forming across more northern areas. I think showers more scattered in the south tomorrow, a little bit more sunshine for places like Cardiff, perhaps Bracknell, down into Southampton and Plymouth as well. But look at the temperatures, really disappointing, 11 degrees. The average this time of the year is closer to around 15. Now I've skipped Friday because Friday is going to be another showery day and gone straight to Saturday. This low pressure is actually going to cut off the supply of cold air from the north and instead we get a supply of subtropical air only briefly. That is going to bring a lot of cloud and some rain uh, on Saturday. Uh, by Sunday in the south and the southeast of the country temperatures could nudge up to 20 degrees Celsius but this is only going to be very brief. Thomas thank you. And that's all from the BBC's News at Six, so it's goodbye from me and on BBC One. We can now join the BBC's news teams where you are.